Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Hamid Keshmushekan, and I'm the convener of this event. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this conference on reinterpreting history and memory, contemporary art of the Middle East and North Africa, or as more recently referred to, Southwest Asia and North Africa, Swana. Before I begin, I uh, need to share that unfortunately, Professor Dino Matar uh, couldn't join us today uh, due to an unexpected personal matter, and she has kindly asked me to uh, read her welcome note in her place. So it looks like I'll be wearing two hats uh, this morning, both as the conference convener and also as her standing on behalf of the Center for global media and communications, the host of this conference. So I'll start with a uh, uh, welcome note. The Center for Global Media and uh, Communications at SOAS is delighted to be hosting this important conference at a difficult time for the Middle East and North Africa, shaped by war, displacement, trauma, and contested memories. It also uh, responds to the need to address uh, the persistence of Eurocentric knowledge by examining artistic practices in the present through a historical lens. This is important particularly within the interdisciplinary field of media and cultural studies, which continue to be obsessed with presentism neglecting to look into histories of cultural and memory production that inform the present and provide a non-colonial entry point for addressing what is actually happening in the region. The conference theme and sessions fit in well with the ethos and the interdisciplinary nature and approach of the center, which include decolonizing knowledge about the global south through practice and theory in diverse cultural genres and outputs. The center, while small in terms of its size, is unique amongst other counterparts in London and the UK, as it is the first center dedicated to researching media and communication through a non-Eurocentric perspective offering three postgraduate degrees and uh, research in the field. Its staff are involved in knowledge production that moves out of Western theories and methodologies. We welcome you all to the conference, and at the end, she kindly thanks me that we can certainly skip. Dina Mata, Chair of Center for Global Media and Communications. And uh, now, as the conference convener, uh, I also would like to share some notes about the conference itself. Although scholars have extensively explored the social and political dimensions of history and memory in contemporary MENA, or SUANA, the role of the art world in engaging with these ideas has often been overlooked. This British Academy conference aims to fill that gap by addressing critical themes that have seen limited discussion but deserve exploration. Our discussions come at a particularly timely moment, as Professor Matar also mentioned, given the ongoing political unrest and wars in the region. These events are directly connected to the themes of this conference, uh, themes that this conference seeks to address, traumatic history and memory. We will explore how artists uh, represent uh, these traumatic experiences and histories, which have shaped collective memory while also challenging hegemonic narratives imposed by both local and global forces. Moreover, we will tackle questions such as how do artists and art activists 
engage with history to challenge authoritarian ideologies and offer alternative narratives. This conference furthermore aims to explore how contemporary art in the MENA region reflects history and memory and how art discourses intersect with broader social, political, and intellectual practices in recent times. The speakers will examine case studies from the Arab world, Iran, Turkey, as well as parallels and shared narratives in South Asia. The discussions will highlight the engaging that engaging with history and memory invariably involves an examination of our present context, often why with the goal of uncovering truths about both the past and the present. Throughout the conference, speakers will discuss how artworks engage with notions of temporal disjunction, cultural memory, and the lasting impact of the past. The papers will critically examine the theme of challenging the present through a reinterpretation of history. The speakers will examine the strategies employed by artists and illustrators and art activists whose creation articulate historical narratives, illuminating their reflect reflections on the past and their responses to the socio-political conditions of the present. This examination will extend to how they scrutinize history and navigate the complexities of its representation. Moreover, the investigation will address how the contemporary MENA region grapples with social, cultural, and political issues, suggesting alternative approaches that enrich the broader discourse on artistic engagement with historical and socio-political contexts. The papers will also address the lasting impacts of significant periods and events on cultural production, highlighting how artists reclaim authority over their individual identities in contrast to the ideological frameworks imposed by local authorities and global forces. Artworks featured in the papers engage with a variety of themes, including regional dynamics, gender identities and gender politics, social corruption, isolation, memory, and trauma. The conference will explore four primary themes each examining different facets of how artists and art activists engage in the debate of historical narratives by challenging and addressing current affairs, thereby shaping their own truths. The first theme, referencing the past, artists' position as subject of history, focuses on how artists reference the past positioning themselves not as narrators of an objectified past, but as active subjects who live through history subjectively. By addressing contentious issues through autobiographical narratives, these artists externalize personal memory, highlighting the complex relationships between the private and the public. The second theme, artists reclaiming authority, challenging dictated ideological frames, explores the visual strategies artists use to reclaim authority over their individual identities, challenging the collective identities imposed by the local authorities and global stereotypes. This, this theme highlights artistic responses to manipulated narratives disseminated through official mainstream channels, addressing the critical issue of agency through their individual trajectories. The third theme, impact of trauma and painful collective memory of the recent past, addresses a crucial topic that contemporary artists in the MENA region and beyond confront the effects 
of trauma and the painful collective memory of recent events, including conflicts, wars, and revolutions on the artistic practices. This exploration investigates how contemporary art intersects with the political dimensions of these experiences, proposing alternative approaches as critical tools to reach a multifaceted aesthetics of resistance. And finally, the fourth theme, approaches to past, past truth and historical records, resonance in the present, centers on the concept of history, specifically addressing concerns related to past truth and historical records. It will explore how artists incorporate to past truth. Sorry, it's explore how artists incorporate fragments of historical reality into their narratives, introducing a reflexive and critical function for art. Moreover, this theme will examine how historical references in these artworks respond to past social transitions, highlighting their continued resonance and influence on contemporary MENA. The conference, above all, aims to establish a new conceptual framework for examining contemporary art and its connection to the concepts of history and memory. Rather than employing art critical and art historical approaches in isolation, it will explore these topics within the social, political, and psychological context of the contemporary MENA region. By engaging a diverse range of professionals, including art historians, cultural theorists, anthropologists, visual culture and literary scholars, and curators, the conference will provide interdisciplinary frameworks for the study of contemporary art from the MENA region and beyond. The organization of this conference required many months of uh, preparation. The entire project would not have been possible without the generous support of the British Academy, for which I'm very grateful. I would also like to thank the SOA Center for um, Global Media and Communications and its chair, Professor Dina Matar, for hosting this conference. Also, I would like to acknowledge my friends and colleagues in the Department of History of Art and Archaeology, particularly Dr. Simon O'Mara for his constant support, as well as uh, Dr. Stephen Murphy and Professor Anna Contadini. I would also like to particularly acknowledge the invaluable contributions of all the speakers and chairs at this conference, including those based in the UK and uh, those who have traveled to London from the US, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. My special thanks also go to Dr. Fatima Taht Keshian for her time and assistance throughout this process with the conference logistics and preparations. I also wish to thank Aki al Burzi from SOAS Middle East Institute for his help with the conference page and for introducing me to key individuals at SOAS. Equally, I need to thank those who are assisting during the conference. I should perhaps thank them at the end of the conference, but I, I may forget or there might not be the chance to do that, so I'm doing it right now. Particularly, Dr. Katisha Hande, who will oversee the presentations along with Audra Noble, Ala Shatila, Zainab Faiz, and Zara Parsons. Uh, two very brief notes about uh, badges. Uh, I would like to ask you all, uh, if you can, please wear your badges that everyone knows who you are during the conference. And also, uh, of two uh, tags, I mean, are added to, uh, I mean, color tags. Uh, to speakers and those who are helping. Blue tags like this, 
uh, she would show that uh, the person is either a speaker or a chair, so it's quite uh, clear. And also, more importantly, the red tags are those uh, for uh, people who are helping and assisting during co the conference. So if you have any questions or inquiry, please refer to these people. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Sorry, just some logistical <laughs> details. Hi, I, my name is Dr. Stephen Murphy. I am um, one of uh, Hamid's colleagues at the School of Arts here at SOAS. And yeah, first of all, it's just a great pleasure to be able to um, chair this opening session. Um, we have, um, yeah, this opening session, Artists Reclaiming Authority, Challenging Dictated ide Ideological Frames. We have uh, three speakers. Um, Two of them are here with us, and one is online. Um, so, um, yeah, the format is each speaker will have 30 minutes, um, and then we will do the Q&A at the end of the session. So, so please keep your questions to the end of the session, where we'll have another 30 minutes to have a discussion. Um, I'll briefly introduce each speaker, um, but if you would like to know more about them, there's very detailed bios in the little... Uh, leaflet, the handout that you've got. Um, so yeah, I don't want to take up any more time. Um, so without further ado, I would like to um, invite Dr. Nada Chabot from the University of Texas, sorry, of North Texas, um, to give her paper, Regenerating History from Ruins, Contemporary Iraqi Artists Reclaim Their Past. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is morning, right? We need tons of coffee, so please um, apologize, uh, uh, accept my apologies if um, I'm not that awake yet, <laughs> but we'll try. But thank you for being here, and thank you, Hamid, for inviting me um, to be here. It's always a pleasure. It feels like a reunion with a lot of colleagues, so I'm happy to be here, uh, even this early in the morning. So. All right, my talk today is about regenerating history from ruins. Contemporary Iraqi artists reclaim their past. I'm going to count on you to keep me on time. Yes, okay, thank you. Iraqi artists during the mid 20th century, wait, yes. too many things to navigate, okay. Iraqi artists during the mid 20th century invoked the country's history and heritage in order to contemplate their post-colonial and post-Ottoman visual past and empower a visual language that would be true to them. As all post-colonial nations and peoples, they needed to come to term with how and why they were colonized, how to rid themselves of that legacy, and how to become this new nation for which they have been assigned new borders. Heritage, its reappropriation and disposition, has always been a tool of power, whether in the hands of colonial powers or national governments. They thus participated in nation building as they aimed to unite their polycultural communities into the construction of an Iraqiness palpable through visual iconography. The most successful example whose experiments still resonate is seen in the work of the Baghdad Group for Modern Art, formed by Jawad Salim and Shakir Hassan al Said in 1951. Their objectives were to reconnect locally through history, <clears throat> where his, uh, sorry, uh, 
reconnect locally where history was interrupted following years of wars, destruction, and stagnation, and to connect internationally through a uniquely progressive Iraqi modern language. Energized by hope, learning their history and seeing their visual past equipped them with confidence and the means to move forward as a new country with new borders in their contrib contribution to develop a national identity. Theirs can be seen as an empowered moment of building anew. Half a century later, Iraqis found themselves again in the need to understand their country, its people, and their threatened national being. The difference between these two moments, of course, is profound and tangible. One was centered around building and the second around destruction. But again, heritage and its appropriation became the center of a new colonial discourse. And again, leading to the 2003 US-led invasion, Iraq was positioned as a, dis as a damsel in distress and in need of liberating. Under the new civilizing mission of Operation Iraqi Freedom, that allowed for the expansion and dissemination of American neoliberal values, Iraq's heritage was usurped by the new colonial powers and particularly promoted in Western media as humanity's heritage and cradle of civilization, and thus justifying the need to rescue the country from the dictatorial rule that held the country's progress and access. We are reminded by the art historian and archaeologist Zainab Bahrani that, I quote, the use of the name Mesopotamia, which became widely accepted as the proper name in place of the Arabic or the Turkish at the height of British and French interest in the region, served to reconfigure the terrain and to cut off the present population from the past, a past which was deemed to belong to the West, just as the craze for digging and collecting Assyrian and Babylonian antiquities spread across Europe and North, Afri uh, North America." End of quote. instead of coffee. The manipulation of heritage was further exasperated by the actions of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, around 2014. Heritage was then positioned between the new saviors and the new destroyers without much regard to what Iraqis felt or thought. All wars, as we all know, while we see ones unfolding today, are devastating as they change all aspects of life, territory, and future of people involved. In the process of liberating Iraq, we all witness a heightened level of transformation of a country through destruction in tangible, material, and quantifiable terms, where antiquities and the work of modern art were looted in April 2003, while Iraq was under US military rule. What was not plundered was eventually heavily damaged throughout the following years of war and occupation, and by the dismantling of the state and the institution of new liberal, systems of economic development and resource extractions. Moreover, as Bahrani assesses, in the background of this transformation ran the dominant revitalized discourse of the benighted Orient and of the benefits of Operation Iraqi Freedom of a civilizing mission at the start of a new millennium. As such, essentially in one stroke, more than half a century of artistic developments to realize and materialize the Iraqiness that the Baghdad Group for Modern Art provoked was erased. The return to ancient heritage to reconstruct the contemporary by modern Iraqi art was predicated on an inter internal relationship between Iraqi artists and Iraq based on hope for a better future under the umbrella of the new nation. Heritage in the form of archeological objects and history as well as the glorious Islamic past was a new learning experience that made them reevaluate folklore within increasing pressures to modernize. Exploring meaning within ancient heritage is, however, what we see today in the work of particularly diaspora Iraqi artists. This paper explores the work of three diaspora artists, Hana Malallah, Wafa Bilal, and Adil Abdin, whose work have been the subject of some of my previous research. I specify, I sp specify this to clarify why I return to their work as it equally expresses their own evolutionary relationship with Iraqi heritage. There are definitely other diaspora Iraqi artists who engage heritage to deliver their message. 
Many have even indirectly heeded the call by the Baghdad group for modern art for Istilham al Turath and redirected their vision towards the local from the outside. This is also not to say that there are no contemporary artists inside of Iraq who's, who engage with heritage. There are certainly new works that do so. They nevertheless seem to mostly center on lamenting the loss or celebrating the past in a crude manner. They do so against the background of a new nation-building policy that is controlled today by the private sector who is funding renovation, renovation and restoration projects of Iraq cities, Iraqi cities to, to counter the destruction. These projects are envisioned through a new liberal um, economy that aims to promote Iraq as a tourist, including religious, destination, while prompting the Iraqis to take pride in their past. Instagram is full of clips recorded by proud Iraqis or happy yet surprised tourists as they navigate a revived historic center in Baghdad or heritage houses turned into restaurants. Moreover, the inequity and gap in the uh, dynamics of operation within and outside of Iraq in terms of resources and possibilities positions the diaspora artists at the moment to navigate a more critical vision. Perhaps their current mobility within the world of their deeper um, and their deeper exposure to uh, various arguments and discourses within the hemisphere they inhabit, distanced uh, from daily distanced from daily lived agony and of destruction, occupation, and corruption in Iraq, has afforded them the space to rethink their relationship to history, heritage, and archaeology. Born in Iraq. The three artists were raised and educated under the Ba'ath Party's specific interpretation of Iraqi heritage during the 1980s Iraq-Iran war that aimed to insert Saddam Hussein specifically into that history and heritage. The three of them left under unhappy circumstances of deprivation or fear for their personal safety, which consequently drastically altered their relationship with the country. Of interest is that in their work after 2003, they focused on current events in Iraq and their interpretation within the Euro-American context. Their more recent projects, however, invoke new relationships with their Iraqi heritage than those of their modern predecessors. Relationships that do not partake in the national history, instead it draws from long-term explorations into historical sites, artifacts, and periods. Reinterpreting the ancient through the contemporary allows them to investigate the destruction that ensued following the last invasion. It is equally their way of navigating traumas and personal pain, loss, anger, and grief while watching from afar their country reimagined through continuous strategic dismantling and reconstruction. In their work, they position heritage within various frames of knowledge. It becomes thus equally an act of reclaiming and comprehending the history of cultural destruction through colonial practices. London-based Iraqi artist Hana Malala left Iraq in 2006. Her work went through a process of different engagement with aspects of Iraqi heritage. Her earlier work, particularly through her graduate studies and its aftermath in Baghdad, explored signs, symbols, and numbers. Of her signature by numbers, for example, she says, it is rooted in my interest in abstract systems and their equivalents, beginning in early Mesopotamian shapes, Islamic charts, and uh, research undertaking in the course of my MA in semiotics and PhD in logic, end of quote. She recalls on her website her generation's renewed interest in heritage following the end of the Iraq-Iran war and under the sanctions of the 1990s that prompted new aesthetics, probably uh, promoted by isolation and uh, necessity to reevaluate their absolutes, a shift in seeing heritage was directed by the co-founder of the Baghdad Group for Modern Art, Shakir Hassan al Said, who, as Malala tells us, was refocusing the gaze of an entire generation of local artists towards the Mesopotamian past enshrined in the phenomenal collection of artifacts housed in the National Archaeological Museum. She continues to say, viewed as modern, 
These objects, many of them marked or ruined by the passage of time, inform the aesthetic direction characteristic of the 80s generation, end of quote. This realization, along with years of wars and destructions, led Malala to develop a, the technique she named ruins technique that includes burning, distressing, and obliterating of material. And based on her need to redirect wars, as she says, intrinsically destructive process to engender the visceral experience of, reality, of the reality of war, irrespective of its ge geographic, political, or political particular. She argued that the traditional modern art materials could not express their artistic message during that time. Instead, they, as she says, worked with burnt paper and cloths, with barbed wire and bullets, with splintered wood and found objects, borrowing from history and our catastrophic presence alike. For many of us, this ruins technique became the visual signifier of our cultural resistance and carrier of our identity as Iraqi artists. Malala's project, Co-Extent Ruins, exploring Iraq's Mesopotamian past through contemporary art, a project that was on exhibition here at London's Brunei Gallery on 18th January through 19th of March, 2022. Ex expresses the evolution of her practice after distance from her former reality and life. It also expresses her anxiety and need to reconnect with the country of her youth as the site of the trauma she still experiences from distance. In 2021, she wrote, this project explores the capacity for artistic research, attending to the political, social, and cultural context within which art functions to explore a new aesthetic where this ancient Mesopotamian heritage as the cradle of civilization is important in shaping Iraq's cult, uh, current traumatic identity for the future, end of quote. The research for this collaborative interdisciplinary project was conducted at four specific and well-known Mesopotamian ancient heritage sites, Ur, Babylon, Naipur, and uh, Nimrud by Malala and four local Iraqi artists, arguing that while these sites were in principle still protected, they were mostly neglected during the years of war and destruction. They have become modern ruins of the past. More importantly, this project highlights the new reification of what once was a lived environment. As argued by Bahrani, a part and parcel of this continuous colonial um, discourse, archeological sites are not allowed to be seen within their lived daily realities of people's interaction, but instead as sites to excavate and contemplate history devoid of historical continuity that is in turn seen as contamination. Malala herself had grown up around such sites and had retained her vivid, tangible memories of interaction. Despite of the national projects of glorifying the past and hence isolating sites, the absence of Western archeological missions to Iraq during the Ba'ath rule kept it as part of the daily fabric. The acts of exploration by Malala and her colleagues aimed to invoke new intimate connections with these historical sites after the years of plunder, exploitations, and destruction. They equally critique the violence enacted by the continued colonial archaeology against the local. They resulted in videos, photographs, and works of, uh, on burned canvas and oil. Displayed together, the exhibition shows the depth of the research and tells the story of past and present violence, but now also allowing a voice for the people to respond. Malala's distorted My Country's Map specifically expresses the, the chaos and pain of the current conditions of Iraq and, her, and hers by extension. While surveying the damage caused, Malala and her colleagues are reacquainting themselves and the viewers with the history and claiming the land back by inserting themselves into the legacy through the use of technology to reconstruct meaning. Malala's main objective is to address the imbalance of power that started as part of the colonial excavations through to the contemporary age. This project, she argues, empowers us to speak. She's aware that she, they, will not be able to counter uh, or balance the power, that the colonialists spoke from a position of power. 
she, they do not have. As such, this research and its multiple projects are now under the, a collective she has termed Ruins, Rebels, and Renewal, exploring Iraq's Mesopotamian past through contemporary art. Malala explains that her practice is centered on the subject of ruins from various aspects based on her own experience with both archaeological Mesopotamian ruins and rubbles left by wars, which she argues symbolizes Iraq today. She says, Mesopotamia is no longer defined as a land between two rivers, but as a landscape reduced by archaeological pillaging and repeated wars to ruins and rubbles. A strategy of reimagining the present through the past. And I think, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah. I mean, okay, let me put you on this for a second so you can see. This was the, for um, the Brunei exhibition, as a matter of fact. A strategy, a strategy of reimagining the present through the past becomes a technique that Malala employs um, in her more recent projects. In a tale of two ruins, the jewelry of plundering and violence, the focus is on two collections of jewelry, each created more than a century apart, yet both intimately entangled with the history, with a history of violence and archaeological plundering of Iraq. My slides are much behind. I apologize. This is from the extent. A century apart, um, sorry. The first collection, Lady Laird's Jewelry, was made by Phillips Brothers in 1869 using antiquities uh, pillaged from Iraq. The second collection, Bomb Wreck Jewelry, that Malala created from the wreckage of two car bombs that exploded in Al Mutanabbi Street in Baghdad on March 5, 2007. Malala argues that these sets of jewelry each enca 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 encapsulates two very different processes of ruination. When brought together, they testify to continuing forms of colonial violence and appropriation in the region where through archaeological excavations or military occupation. That's the jewelry, I apologize. Look at it quickly because we're moving. Yes. <laughs> the strategy takes on a more personal angle in the current project Malala is working on, the daffodils, similarities of opposites, where Malala explores the letters of the infamous Gertrude Bell, a beloved of many Iraqis. Malala has been reading the collection of Bell's letters that were sent during her time in Mesopotamia to Britain within a Saidian framework and responding to them. Accepting these letters as part of her, Malala's, personal legacy while reflecting on her life in Iraq, a country structured by the imperial legacy of British occupation, Malala is exploring what she calls entanglements of similarities and opposites. Bell journeyed from Yorkshire to London and Baghdad, where she became a chief architect of British policy in the Middle East while Malala journeyed from Baghdad to London and Yorkshire, a century later as a refugee. The inversion of the consequences of these experiences form the basis of this research project. Aware of the inherent imbalance of the two circumstances as Bell colonialist voice in the letters was of a position of power supported by the British colonial period, while Malala's responses are that of a post-colonial refugee she argues that the project thus highlights how that colonial legacy has shaped the life experience of the colonized. Malala deconstructs Bell's letters to modify them to tell her own contemporary story as a refugee in London, as well as her relationship to her ancient heritage. She reclaims that sense of ownership displayed in Bell's letters. She selects certain texts from Bell's letters to extract and replace pertinent words to equally update Bell's letters with what has happened since she wrote them a century ago, to speak of the implications of Bell's acts and the British legacy in shaping the terrain of conflict today. Along with Malala's uh, paraphrasing of Bell's letters, 
The project includes a set of images and, so and a sound installation and is supported by six research papers written in collaboration between scholars and Malala. Daffodils, the title of the work, referenced one of Bell's letters where she writes about planting this nostalgic British flower in, um, in the contrasting fertile um, Mesopotamian soil. By accident, Malala found a shimmering phosphorus daffodil logo over her photo on the first travel document she received in the UK after seeking asylum. The daffodils thus create a link between the past and the present as a constant reminder of the colonial experience. New York-based Iraqi artist Wafa, Wafa Bilal left Iraq in 1991 and settled in the US in 1993. His work has engaged with history and heritage of Iraq using technology and media through his performative and interactive work. From navigating human reactions to recasting obscure moments into imaginary possibilities, Bilal's work evolved th uh, through the int intricacies of the conflicting cultural spaces he occupies while pushing himself and his viewers into zones of extreme tensions and discomfort with the goal to initiate dialogues. As an activist, he has often inserted his body into the, his controversial work, exposing it to pain and agony while documenting his and the viewers' um, interactions. Because of the soberness of his topics, Bilal often infuses humor in his work. Humor, he argues, is a great way to break the layers of barrier that surrounds his audience in, his US, um, uh, in the US about atrocities made in their name in a distant land. In his recent projects, Bilal has provided a restorative option to the viewers. His 168 colon, uh, 01 project acted on two levels. It brought awareness to the plight of libraries and education in Iraq, while equally accumulating shipments of books to replace looted and burned ones in the library of the College of Fine Arts in Baghdad. The title of the exhibition, 168 01, references the destruction of the academic center, uh, Beit al-Hikmah, House of Wisdom, which contained the largest library during the ninth century in Baghdad. Four centuries later, a Mongol siege laid waste to all the libraries of Baghdad along with the House of Wisdom. According to some accounts, the library was thrown into the Tigris River to create a bridge of books for the Mongol army to cross. The pages bled ink into the river for seven days or 168 hours, after which the books were drained of knowledge. In A Grain of Wheat, Cultivating Hybrid Futures in Ancient uh, Seed DNA, Bilal takes the notion of documenting, archiving, and preservation to a futuristic dimension, arguing that Iraq's dramatic history of war, invasion, imperialism, colonialism, and more recently terrorism has given it a portfolio of cultural destruction almost as, as outside, outstanding as its legacy of civilization. Bilal searched for a new method of creative preservation that equally connects the plundered heritage in museums around the world. As he explains, working with scientists, labs, and museums, this interdisciplinary project is achieved through splicing ancient Mesopotamian civilization with post-cultural planetary futures through a poetic act of preservation to archive the 3,000-year-old winged bull of Nineveh the sphinx-like uh, sphinx -like Lamassu, one of the ancient Near East's most enduring iconographical symbols of blessing and protection inside the DNA of Iraqi wheat seeds. Through his project, using visionary developments in molecular digital data storage, Bilal aims to keep the memory of this destruction in the collective memory of humanity as a more effective method to raise heritage consciousness for the future while equally hoping to initiate a comprehensive seed bank of biodigital surrogates to safeguard and incubate endangered Iraqi cultural her heritage and hopefully a way to test a, the potential of an in vitro DNA data storage technique in cultural preservation. 
five. Yeah. No, I saw. Thank you. Connecting artifacts and institutions begins by linking the ruined Lamassu of Mosul with a sister Lamassu from the Mesopotamian Museum, uh, from the Metropolitan uh, Museum, Freudian slip, Museum of Art to acquire 3D digital scans to encode into the wheat seed DNA. Bilal sees this as an, effective, an efficient and sustainable way to particularly battle against not only war destruction, but climate change effects on cultural heritage as well. In a grain of wheat, he hopes would initiate a process of a visionary future that allows for the development of a collaborative seed bank dedicated to Iraq's material culture and perhaps to a larger universal DNA anthology of the planet creative inheritance. In the process, this project also acquires several different forms of knowledge to reach Bilal's goals. As Bilal tells us, Iraq has no seed bank. Thus, research is needed to index the types and, and, and locations of Iraq's ancient grains. An index of linking artifacts within archaeological sites and museums is also necessary. It thus positions colonial plunder and a dialogue about repatriation as part of the discourse of preservation. Perhaps the collaboration between museums around the world would also forces new archaeological practices as well as new objectives for the museums. By some coincidence, or perhaps universal design, as I was writing this bit, I contacted Bilal to ask for images when he received the actual seeds that are in his hand. We were both had a very emotional moment. My last artist, based uh, between Helsinki and um, Amman, Iraqi artist Adil Abdin left Iraq in 2000. His work used irony and sarcasm to navigate changes, uh, change realities of his personal ex existence and that of Iraq. This sarcasm I use, he says, is nothing but a medium of provocation to serve the purpose of extending the mental borders of the artwork beyond the limits of the exhibition space. But what is, it also does, it helps him deal with the trauma of it all. Abdin is a multimedia artist who uses video installation, multimedia sculptures, and sound-based installation uh, and photography to explore the issues of the contemporary world and complex relationships between art, politics, and identity. As did um, Bilal, Abdin explored the limits and realities of the new cultures he found himself living in, particularly Helsinki, a place as different as possible from Baghdad, and also in time gravitated beyond the um, uh, present moments of new life outside of Iraq and the new realities in Iraq to explore a past that could inform the future. His work thus necessitated a search into history where he faced what he called a lack of credible resources for Arab history that he, see, he sees still is shrouded in ambiguity, allowing for a broad range of interpretations and augmentations. This was his experience while preparing for this work on the Zinj Rebellion. Aiming to explore and subvert a history always written by the victor, Abdin unpacked one of the earliest known revolts against the Abbasid Caliph, known as the Zinj Rebellion, that began near the city of Basra in southern Iraq in 869 and lasted till 883. Mainstream history tells us that the Zinj refers, refers to enslaved Southeast Africans, but new historiography points to it possibly being a wider revolt. The rebellion was led by Ali ibn Mahmoud, whose background in history remains equally controversial with much unknown, and in time, it grew to include slaves and freemen, both Eastern Africans and Arabs from several regions of the Caliphate, and is recorded in history as one of the bloodiest revolts that claimed tens of thousands of lives before it was fully defeated. Some of the controversy is in relation to the use of the term Zinj, and whether it, it uh, specifically means the Bantu people of East African coast or whether it is used to mean blacks or African in general. Nevertheless, the rebellion was in relation to living conditions of the enslaved Africans who were used in agricultural labor to drain the marshes, salt, and prepare the land for planting, as well as mine its salt. 
The Revolt as a Project, Abdin tells us, emphasizes the important role of oral storytelling and Arab culture in shaping historical narratives and presents the untold voices of the Zanj across four chapters, documents on salt, saline lands, unmatched narrative, and on. In, doc in documents on salt, Abdin carves in salt tablets, oral history of the narrative of the revolt, including a letter etched into a salt uh, block conveying the first-hand account of a young man recounting um, his father's narrative of the rebellion. These sculptures serve as <coughs> invaluable relics. Through the various chapters of representation and reinterpretation, Abdin creates a set of new documents that allows for alternative stories. In his Karen Still in Progress that I will tell you in 50 seconds, um, they were here. Abdin employs the very well-known Sumerian artifact from the third millennium that was excavated from the Ur Royal Cemetery and is currently at the British Museum, the standard of Ur wooden box, to explore the shifts in Iraqi culture and society following 2003 invasion. This is a project that actually is still in, the, in progress and unfinished because it was meant to be exhibited in Beirut, but of course now that exhibition is on hold. In essence, um, Abdin is blaming the neoliberal economic principles that were brought with the U.S. occupation and its policies of restructuring Iraq after dismantling its institutions for instituting what he calls a consumption, a con a consumption hegemony that altered the ways Iraq viewed and associated with their deep-rooted cultural heritage. So, you know, in his um, uh, opinion, if the Sumerians were here, seeing what was happening in Iraq, they would have packed up their civilization and moved, migrated somewhere, probably. In conclusion, as I must conclude, um, the work of the three diaspora Iraqi artists discussed today merged the interpersonal, historical, and political to not only explore and unpack, but to also present and propose new alternatives. They use research, technology, and activism to learn the history of their country and in their efforts to dis disseminate that knowledge while they document, archive, and preserve Iraqi heritage that continues to be threatened. In the process, they creatively keep the dialogue open and the memory alive after Iraq has mostly faded from the collective consciousness, particularly as new horrors are committed daily around the region. While these projects provide them with spaces to negotiate realities and trauma, the beautiful work they create in the process are their ult ultimate form of resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Nada Shabat. Our next speaker is online. It's um, Basiv Kortan. Uh, he's a research and curatorial advisor at Mataf Doha, and his paper is entitled 100 Years. Um, we're just going to try and call him up now. I'm here. Great, thank you. You're here in a disembodied voice. We're just trying to get you up on screen. Uh, just give us a moment. There we are. Do you want to, I think, but minimize it so we can see the slide? Oh, is, is he going to share, is he? Oh, he's okay. going to share. I'll, okay. I'll share the slides. Great, so if you share yeah. your slides now. We'll... Okay. So, okay, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Mr. Hamid. And uh, apologies for not being uh, there because it, it's complicated with the Turkish uh, visa situation right now, especially for Europe, given that we have about 4 million uh, Syrian uh, new resident refugees, and uh, but the, the unofficial numbers go up to about 13 million altogether with Afghanis, uh, Russian dissidents, Syrians, early Iraqis, and uh, now Palestinians. So it's very hard to get uh, for uh, citizens of Turkey and new citizens of Turkey to get visas outside, uh, especially for Fortress Europe. 
So uh, I'll just go right into it. A sharp Canadian uh, curator, Bruce Ferguson, told me in 1992 that Turkey manages the impossible. It does an institutional disappearance act. Bruce was referring to the near absence of artists from Turkey outside the country. Not only their reluctance to participate in Turkish exhibitions collectively, and their suspicions of such invitations, but also their understanding that little would change if they showed outside. It was easy to come up with excuses that Turkey had an ex extensive hinterland, that our typical cultural upbringing favored adab, modesty, and self-promotion was looked down upon, and that we were schizophrenic about our place in the world and between worlds. So I'll try to unpack this singularity today to set a stage for modern and contemporary art history in Turkey from a different perspective to explain the institutional disappearance. The bridge between the East and West. Now, geography matters. It's normal for citizens of Turkey to read in the same European newspaper, to be in the Middle East on the front page, and in Europe on another page. Turkey, too, chose to benefit from this schizophrenia. When the Met organized the exhibition Suleiman the, exhibition, uh, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent in 1984, Turkey came up with the advertising, they built the bridge. Bridges are anything but a place. However, bridging provides the handy drop that Turkey employs in policy. Turkey, however, is not between the East and the West. It's between the former lands it ruled in East Europe and the South and, South and Eastern Mediterranean. In other words, in old terms, between the Balkans and the Middle East. The Europeanness of the Balkans is undoubtedly negotiable. And according to political analysts of the region, like Robert Kaplan, who came up with the argument, there is no Middle East, and added Balkans to it during the Bosnian War between 92 and 95. We should also remember that Wahhabism has established a growing following in countries like Bosnia and Kosovo in the last three decades. The building and restoration of mosques and other historical mon monuments in these regions are often done by the Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency. And Turkey's British Council, Yunus Emre Institutes, operate in both areas. A security corridor between the North and South. After World War II, Turkey served not as a bridge, but as a wall and a security corridor. Its strategic value prevented the Soviets from having a pathway to the Mediterranean. It was the main reason it quickly acceded to NATO, along with Greece in 1952. NATO accession was followed by the Regional Defense Alliance of CENTO, Central Treaty Organization, established in 1955 between Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, and Turkey, and United Kingdom. Iraq left the organization in 1959, following the Mosul uprising. The organization was dissolved after the Iranian Revolution of 1979. CENTO was a security corridor and a cultural project aimed to counterbalance the Soviet influence in the region. To this end, the founders established a new institution, Regional Cooperation for Development, with an ambitious cultural and educational program. A regional cultural institute was established in Tehran. Exhibitions, comprehensive programs, and educational initiatives were there. And there were even plans to establish a university like SOAS in Islamabad. However, efforts at incorporating Egypt and other countries in North Africa into CENTO did not yield any result, and as a result, CENTO was left without an Arab presence. Unfortunately, most of the modern art exhibitions and cultural programs realized in the context of regional collaboration have not been deeply researched. The fifth Tehran Biennial in 1966 radically shifted its focus by including artists from Turkey and Pakistan. This perspective, the articulation of regionalism in the biennial, was closely tied to Cold Europe, Cold War alliances, as the idea of cultural regionalism was preceded by the security cooperation. The organization of regional biennials and countries' participation directly hinged on the political landscape. It was sim simultaneously influenced by the national and binary Cold War politics between the Arab and the non-Arab Middle East. The regionalism in the biennials of the Cold War 
and cultural diplomacy can be best illustrated through the absence and presence of Turkey in two of, three of the oldest pioneers in the Middle East. Respectively, <clears throat> the Alexandria Biennial for Mediterranean countries established in 55 and the Tehran Biennial in, in 1958. Alexandria Biennial was a Nasser period project. The first edition included artists from eight countries, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, France, Greece, Italy, Yugoslavia, Spain. Albania, Morocco, and Tunisia joined in the second edition in 57. Nasser passed away in 1970, and Turkey participated only in 1972 in the ninth edition. So its absence was conspicuous as the only country in, in the Mediterranean basin left out of the first eight shows. Now, who decides where you belong? Recently, I was searching the catalog of 1986 uh, Triennale, India, an exhibition in which several artists took, uh, from Turkey took part. I locate publication in Asia Art Archive, but artists from Turkey were not in the catalog item description. They were non-existent. Talking to colleagues at AAA revealed the strange fact that Turkey's artists were not added to the publication description because Turkey, according to AAA catalogers all the time, was outside Asia. Was it then in Europe? That made me remember my disqualification from Manifesta exhibition as one of the curators, the first Manifesta exhibition, because the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs had decided that Manifesta was a European exhibition and Turkey was not in Europe. So I was disqualified. Empire and colony, Eastern empires and the Ottoman exception. The Ottoman state was ne neither a colonial empire like the European colonial powers, nor like the Russian and Chinese colonialism. Eurasian colonialism began in the 17th century with the annexation of Siberia. A vast amount of literature on salty water or Atlantic colonization poses coloniality as a determinant. But it overlooks the steppe colonization and cultural sinicization of East Asia by China and Russians' annexation of the northernmost regions of Europe, Siberia, Turkestan, and the Caucasus, and turning nomads into settlers by force. Hence, the sole non-colonial empire remains the Ottomans, even with its awkward efforts in the 19th century to try to become one. Neither assimilation nor domestication. As a subject of a state that developed out of an expansionist empire, I was not able until recently to understand that in the history writing of some Arab countries, and not, not that I reflected that just uh, at the beginning of her talk, there's a concept of the Ottoman period followed by the colonial period. At the end of World War I, with the collapse and fragmentation of the Ottoman lands, the issue was not transformed, was transformed, but not resolved in fact, made much, much worse by the British mandate. The Ottomans had ruled multinational, multi-ethnic, and multi-denominational spheres under one state, with different regulation and degrees of autonomy. The structure allowed for a particular cohabitation and was probably the lesser of two evils. Still, the Ottoman period needs more scholarship regarding governance and how it differs from classical coloniality. Tanzimat refers to a period of Western influence reforms in the Ottoman Empire that began in 1839. Tanzimat means reorganization or restructuring, and it eventually led to the assimilation of, complete assimilation of Western nationalism. And it ended with Akhet, the original term for the great catastrophe of 1915. Akhet incidentally means the same thing as Nakba, the great catastrophe. The Turkish Balkan subjects of the empire implemented the horrors of genocidal nationalism on the bodies of Western Armenia. This had no precedent in the history of the Ottoman state, but it was nevertheless in alignment with the future practices of the nascent Turkish state. The new state restructured its relationship with its subjects. What it ultimately led to was a slavish emulation with selective Western institutionality, especially with the inkilabs, 
or in the late, late 1920s or change of form, such as the Latinization of the alphabet, the adaptation of the Roman calendar, Western dress codes, outlawing religious orders and radical secularization. The Turkish war of independence was not a war against colonizers. It was a war against the invaders. I will speak a bit later about the crucial differences and its exploitation by the Turkish left who thought that the war was against colonizers and they were led by a mythical liberator Atatürk who decolonized the country from the reluctant invaders. I will also explain that, in, that 1968 was a particular experience for Turkey that had little to do with postcoloniality. Turkey's nemesis in the 1960s in the leftist circles was the United States, and a big chunk of the left was pro-Soviet. Hence, Turkey learned nothing from Arab nationalism and African liberation movements or India. And in the mid-90s, anti-American protests began. The Turkish left interpreted the African independence movements of the 1950s from a particular angle and defined them as anti-imperialist movements and missed their importance by linking them to the Turkish War of Independence. Even Franz Fanon was translated into Turkish only in the mid-1980s. Turkish intellectuals still find it difficult to ingest the colonial discourse. The precise reason behind this is that Turkey was in invested, completely invested in the infallible idea of Western ideational and civilizational concepts to such an extent to such an extent that African Asian star socialism was thought to be untenable because it did not bear the civilized Western heritage of socialism. In April 1955, representatives of 29 governments from Asian and African nations met in Mandung, Indonesia, to discuss peace and the role of the Third World in Cold War, economic development and decolonization. The Bandung Conference laid the foundation of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War. Turkish Deputy Prime Minister Fatin Rüştü Zorlu delivered a pro-NATO and pro-America pro speech and which he was for which he was harshly rebuked by the Indian Prime Minister Nehru, especially concerning NATO. This group drew a deep wedge for many years between Turkey, India, and the Arab world. Consequently, in 1962, during the conflicts between the Greek and Turkish Cypriot communities, India sided with Greece, and the Arab world was not persuaded either. Turkey understood the hard way that the third world states were crucial especially in the UN, but the dice were cast and its weak links to the third world haunted the country and beleaguered its foreign policies for a long time. In 1958, Turkey's abstention from the vote on Algeria's right to self-determination, which was struggling for independence from France, on the grounds of its engagement, on Turkey's grounds of engagement with the Western alliance, pointed out to the symbolic collapse to its claim to anti-imperialist leadership. Deficit. Tonel Bora, in his book Currents, writes of the overlap of post-colonial thought with the stories of other modernizations and reminds that, that uh, us that thinkers of Asian and African origin carry the need for a radical confrontation sharpened by the pain of the colonial past and education in the colonial structures of the West, structures ingrained in their homeland. The Muslim conservative thinker Ali Bulaj writes that in societies subject to colonization, out of suffering came grace. Considering that Turkey has had not such an experience, Bulaj regards the situation, our situation, as a deficit. In other words, according to Bulaj, Turkey is lacking compared to, for example, Algeria, India, or Angola. The deficiency refers not only to the experience of the lack of experience of the anti-colonial struggle but also to the lack of self-realization through colonial education. The lack also refers to the auto-colonization of the secularist founding elite of Turkey. The approaches of Ali Bulaj and other Muslim conservative thinkers like Samiha Ayverdi assume that the lack of colonial experience has allowed the disposal of Turkey's treasures of history and wisdom with stupid in their extravagance and resulted in a cultural orphanhood and it created, it created a trauma of identity. Perhaps more so, 
the inseparable confluence of postcolonial thought and other modernism has not yet occurred in Turkey, has not occurred in Turkey. And it's an overdue discussion, a foundational issue waiting to be unpacked. Turkey's state-led intelligentsia shopped around in the 1930s for heritage. That could be anything but Ottoman, and sought to replace it, substitute it, with state-sponsored mythical past, such as Hittitism or Sumerianism. In the 1950s, once the ideal citizens of the young state had been formed, leftists invested in blue Anatolianism, a kind of Aegean appropriation of Greek and Ionian culture. But in contrast, the nationalist right was invested deeply in an expanded pan-Turkic ideology. The circus, the circle was closed in, two, in the last two decades, this time by a state-sponsored neo-Ottomanism engaged in the selective plunder of the past and weaponizing it. The 1960s. The Turkish left read the Af African independence movements of the 1950s from an anti-imperialist perspective and missed their significance by linking them to the Turkish war of independence. The absence of post-colonial thought, not even as academic discourse, partly explains Turkey as an exception. Not having experienced the non-aligned movement and the Arab world's place in it, also met the country was deprived of the post-colonial debate. <coughs> Unless colonial phenomena and Turkish culture following a Western ideational and civilizational concepts are fully unpacked, the friction with Turkey's regional position will continue to persist. I remember Said's Orientalism in the mid-1980s and understood when I read it, uh, understood that the book was not about the Ottoman state and Turkey at all. That experience had made me feel very lonely. The leftist followers of Ataturk, the Kemalists, saw Turkey's move away from the anti-imperialist mission, joining CENTO and NATO after World War II as akin to betrayal. They argued that after the death of Ataturk, the country's independence was compromised. The highly influential novelist, novelist Kemal Tahir, who preached a leftist, localist disgust of the West, regarded Westernization as degeneration and loss of identity. Tahir wrote of it as an impenetrable abyss from which escape became increasingly difficult. The history of colonization and the establishment of West's rule as the West. Now, critical analysis that address the dialectic of Orientalism and Westernism and the history, of process, and, the history and practice of modernization in the non-Western world owes much to post-colonial thought. The thinkers of Asian African descent who formed the movement articulated the need for a radical confrontation sharpened by the pain of the colonial past and the schooling of the colonial West that was ingrained in their homelands. The theoretical possibility of their work to come to terms with the past opened new horizons for analyzing both the subject and the object of imperialism and colonialism. In the 1960s, the world was imbued with a left-wing atmosphere. Communication had become more widespread and there was an explosion of translated books. Many Asian and African countries bore the pride and promise of decolonization as Baathist socialism has revitalized Arab countries. The non-aligned movement distanced itself from the USA and the USSR dominated bloc. One of the results of the USA's per perceived favoritism of Greece in arms aid and the ban on the use of the weapons in Cyprus and the embargo started in Turkey. <clears throat> the government launched the nation does it campaign in 65, but the world was already too, too entangled to isolate an economy. The disengagement from unaligned countries was also echoed in the Cyprus question. India, for example, regarded Turkey as a satellite of the Western bloc uh, until to all the way through the 70s, partly also due to the Kashmir issue, relations with Pakistan and some central provisions. And if it were not for the threat of continental China, the relationship between Turkey and India would surely be much more strained. Anti-imperialism as anti-Americanism also had a cultural front. The influential cultural and political magazine, Yuan, for example, launched a... Uh, let me try to share with you some images here. So apologies, just for a second. Oh, okay, I can't because it's disabled. If you may put the first slide on. 
Yeah, we're doing it. Launched, great. Launched a campaign in 1960 against drinking Coca-Cola. Yun, uh, uh, yeah, if one of you could stay there for a second. Or you can actually activate my uh, share screen and I can share it from here. Ah, okay, got it. Got it, great. Done. Great, we okay. can see it, yep, brilliant. Super, thank you. Throughout the late 1960s, only one publishing house, Ant, came close to discussing Palestine. Whoop, oh, I'm sorry. Just so, hold on, just. Hmm. Palestine in Latin America. And then again, from a, uh, then again, only from a guerrilla and military perspectives. In short, for the leftist Turkish intelligentsia, colonialism has no complexity. It is something akin to an invasion that given the means one could push back, which is, I we know is not so easy. It should not be forgotten, the nationalist conservatives also ra railed against American cultural imperialism in, the, in this period. Najib Fazil, for instance, found the American influence penetrates us, which was horrible and hybridized the nation with the admixture of nations. However, the nationalist conservative spectrum was in favor of maintaining a political alliance against communism with the USA, while shunning its cultural hegemony. In the 60s, Najib Fazl set the national standard, disgust for Muscovites, dislike for Americans. My concern is to find a way to discuss Turkey's relative uniqueness without att attaching a positive meaning to the singularization. I'm interested in the manifestations and residues in isolation in the positions and the works of the artists, albeit not consciously. Such a task is inevitably outside the chronological and summative discipline. Me and my colleagues, we always felt that discussion with peers from different places often met a stifling impasse. It's hard to find a place between the grand statements of Western colleagues because they're common in the spring, queer in the summer, decolonized in the fall, and in the winter, they go back to business as usual. Even when they confront coloniality, our Western friends ignore the invasiveness inherent in their thinking. On the opposite end of the table is the righteous, infallible approach of friends from the global south. Not being part of the colonial binary means that you're not part of an interde interdependency. And for this reason alone, the disorbitant nature of the decolonial process finally offers a respite from the colonial post-colonial binary. One reason why Turkish artists did not find a place in the exhibitions outside Turkey in the 80s and the 90s, and why they were not included in many projects like global conceptualism or magicians of the earth, except Sarkis, is that the Western countries organizing these exhibitions do not feel obliged to recompense Turkey. The 60s were at the time transformational. The generation that came of age was educated in staunchly secularist positivist system in leading institutions, bastions of rationality and efficiency with the firm belief that the war of independence was second to none and doing good for the country was the holiest of paths. Conservative thinkers had mostly passed away or been silent, leaving the field, field to a leftist monoculture. Artists also became civilians in the 1960s. Two years ago, I participated in a research project on Özer Kabaş, this is a book, with colleagues at South in Istanbul. Kabaş was an artist, educator, filmmaker, writer, and designer who studied engineering at, engineering at Robert College, today's Boğaz, Bosphorus University, Boğaz University, followed by an MA at Yale University under Joseph Albers. It's only telling that Kabaş put the last nail in the coffin of ruling artistic discourses. He wrote, that the templates of figure painting were imported from the Fez. For example, with forms of cubism, the Turkish peasant was divided into, a sketch, into sketches, squares, and triangles, and painted in a strange manner, far removed from his essence. Kabash was referring to Nurullah Bak's work, which you see on the screen. Bak was an artist, the commissioner of Turkey's Venice and Sao Paulo Biennials, and one of the nominators of Turkish artists in the Paris Biennials. 
He was also a critic and contributed to the dominant narrative of modern art in Turkey for decades. So Turkish avant-gardism was a state model of destroying the old and replacing it with the new, meaning European, and adopting folkloric motifs, such as you see in this painting, and presenting an alignment of a national art, a state style, distancing themselves from the abstractions of the avant-garde or taming it with local contenting. Kabash was, however, equally critical of the ingestion of lyrical abstraction. This is uh, as experienced in a drawing she presented to Madame Miss Gray in 1969 in Istanbul. Kabash had enough of abstraction he saw in the late 1950s in the United States and the new images of men at MoMA, New York in 1959, an exhibition exploring figurative expressionism had a profound effect on him. Kabash was not from the academy. He was also <coughs> intimate with an astounding generation of theater professionals from Robert College. Among, among the play stage there was Jeunesse Lenegre. The play was written under the influence of Frantz Fanon, during the Algerian war on the ideology of the gays and the ways white seas, white sea blacks and colonialism. It was first performed in Paris at the end of 59 and off Broadway in 61. Lenek reached Turkey in 1965, the third country to stage the play. It was translated into Turkish by the act actor and director Ali Taigun. Azar Kabash realized the decor with another colleague. The masks, the critical element of the play, were also created by Kabash. We know that Ali Taigun was passionate about Jeune then and had met the author while studying at Yale. It will take time to unpack the staging of this play outside two countries with black histories and how it relates to Turkey. Is it arbitrary? We don't know. Is it the love of Jeune? We don't know. Why this play in particular? We don't yet know yet. Two other figures, two other luminous figures of theater history are Sururi, uh, Guru Sururi and Engin Cezar. Another graduate of Robert College and Yale University's theater department, Engin Cezar was in the lead role in a play based on James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room at the Actors Studio in New York. Cezar had won Baldwin's admiration and friendship for his role in the role in the love of two gay couples. And Cesar had invited Baldwin to Istanbul, where Baldwin lived on and off for 10 years between 1961 and 1970. After visiting Israel in 61, Baldwin was radically disappointed with what he saw. He was depressed and broke. Baldwin was nick nicknamed Jimmy the Arab in Turkey. In his own words, Turkey saved my life, helped him get away from the systemic race racism in the US and allowed him to look at the US from outside and breathe. He was most likely drawn into this third option outside the colonial history after exploring Israel for a similar purpose only to witness settler colonialism first, first hand. Enter Pakai. Pakai was an engineering student at Robert College in Istanbul. He self-studied photography. After spending many hours in the college's library, Pakai saw so Richard Avedon's works. Avedon was a high school classmate and lifelong friend of James Baldwin. Kapai, uh, Pakai, art teacher, Pakai's art teacher was Kabash and he introduced him to Baldwin. And Pakai followed Baldwin throughout 1964 and 66 in Istanbul, wherever he went. These photographs of the time bring a complex complexity to Baldwin's days uh, and Kabash told Pakai to study photography at Yale, where he wrote to the dean of the School of Art and Architecture, and he was accepted where he lived for the rest of his life. These are three soldiers from the Sixth Fleet uh, uh, meeting James Baldwin in the Old City. The sculptor and political activist, a close friend of Kabash, was Kuzgun Najar. Kuzgun was, Ethiop was of Ethiopian origin, whose prolific artistic practice constitutes a prescient material inquiry at the intersection of class, blackness, and identity. His work, The Elegy of a Modern Man, made entirely of nails, was awarded the first prize at the Second Biennale of Paris in 61. Kuzgunajar primarily used scrap materials such as nails, wiles, metals in his career. 
the sculpture of a modern man and his use of nails welding uh, and welding refute the center periphery debates. Ajar's use of unconventional materials refers to his and incidentally to Sarkis' youth, where they spent their summers um, working for construction and Sarkis in shoe repair shop, straightening, out, uh, straightening used nails to deploy them again. It's also a work about labor and solidarity. <clears throat> So, um, as, it's, as it sits squarely outside of the archaeological inventions of authenticity, a type of cultural defense throughout modernity with a desperate stand, search for essence. Like such as some Egyptian artists' appropriation of a pharaonic past they had little to do with, or the non-religious artists' convenient use of Sufi mysticism, or the claim that abstraction is, is a form of taking back the natural expression of specific geographies, is a malaise consolidated with national art history scenarios. The question is not picking from historical inventories, extractions, excavations from conveniently nationalized resources, but it is what we make of that experience and that engagement. The next step in this study will be an attempt to relocate artists like Antal Gurman, Fusunonur, Ajar, Koman, Sarkis, Ferit Edgu, and others who navigated, who navigated their careers outside these debates of authenticity, neither as Garbzadeh, West Trucks, nor as Garb Furush, as West Peddlers, nor as nationalist non-figurative geometric montages or folkloric appro appropriations. Finale. The novelist, the novelist Oz Atai passed away at the age of 43 in, 43 in 1977 from a brain tumor. The writer Marve Emre penned recently a review for the New Yorker uh, for New Yorker on the translation of Atai's Waiting for Fear. Emre writes, Atai's narrat narrators are obsessives. Among their main fixation is a modern Turkish, a language made of flashy imports, French and English cognates, a new alphabet, and antique idioms. She quotes Atai, my country and its people infuriated me. Close quote. The narrator of the Waiting for Fear complains. I didn't exist. I didn't even occupy a place where I could say I didn't exist. Barry Errol continues, where he is livid, the narrator of a letter unsent is apologetic, obsequious even, in his address to the cultivated man with whom he works. He doesn't want to burden you with my troubles using a dated vernacular and old fashioned expression. So I've located a dictionary and I am keeping it close at hand while I write these words. And the narrator of uh, a letter to my father is more rueful. He wishes that his dead father had made peace with his culture's borrowed words and left behind a work of significance. And I quote, it's just that in this country where no one really knows much about anything, I wonder if you couldn't have used the old scissor, scissor method and taken a little of this and a little of that from the works of foreign writers, of course, and left us with a text or two. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next uh, speaker needs uh, no introduction. It's uh, Dr. Hamid Kirshenberg Shakin. Um, and he is going to talk to us about uh, haunted narratives, reinterpretations of history in art practices of post-revolutionary Iran. Uh, In Inspectors of Marx, data point, posits ontology as a philosophy of history that challenges the linear progression of time, suggesting the present is haunted by both past and future. In this paper, I show 
how this concept is epitomized in post-revolutionary Iranian art practices, we challenge the notion of a correct history. I discuss how artists navigate and contest an ideologically structured history imposed by the political system, which prioritizes its own ideals and marginalizes alternative perspectives. I use ontology as a framework to explore narratives, histories, and discourses haunted by repressed or forgotten elements of the past. Specifically, I adopt a ontological interpretation to read works of artists whose recurring references to the past carry hidden or suppressed stories that continue to shape the present. These works signify a perception of history that is constantly intertwined with the present understanding, echoing John Locus's notion, the historian, of a participant history, in which our knowledge is not only personal, it is also participant. While briefly looking at the broader subject of history and memory in contemporary Iran, I argue that artists have not been observed by the Iranian state's uh, soft power, which aims to impose its political and ideological values on the nation's life. This dynamic is inevitably related to the question of power and resistance. Thus, I further contend that artists' resistance is debated through their works by engaging with themes such as political history and power relations. Before examining the works of artists, uh, it is useful to briefly address some context. The 1979 revolution marked a pivotal moment in Iran's recent history, leading to the establishment of a theocratic state and the replacement of the modernist secular Pahlavi political-cultural practices from 1925 to 1979 with an Islamic revolutionary ideological discourse. During the revolutionary struggles, followed by the eight-year bloody war with Iraq from 1980 to 88, the Islamic Republic's singular ideology dominated all domains of Iranian life, including cultural activity. The inevitable outcome was an ideological Islamization which the state's version of Islam sought to negate individual autonomy. Consequently, from their inception, the cultural policies of the Islamic Republic were inherently ideological and political. To enforce uh, these uh, policies, the state not only controlled the media, but also established the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, in Persian, Vezarat Farhang va Irshad Islami, to regulate cultural activities, including oversight of art exhibitions and other media. Nevertheless, the politicization of all aspects of Iranian social and cultural life by the Islamic theocracy has given rise to numerous contradictions and conflicts. These tensions encompass cultural practices that exhibit resilience and a refusal to disappear, characterized by new interpretations of national culture and counter-narratives that challenge the state's hegemonic discourse. Many artists, particularly from the new generations, born after the revolution, actively confront the compulsory structures that seek to direct and dominate belief systems and actions. Returning to Locus's concept of participant history, a considerable body of contemporary art practices in Iran function as presentations and dialogues that respond to current times. Uh, these works in integrate complex pasts into contemporary narratives. Meanwhile, the painful history of post-revolutionary Iran marked by war, mass political execution, particularly in the 1980s, systematic elite killings in the 1990s, 
cultural repression and recurrent violent suppression of social uprising, the last one being a couple of years ago, the Women Life, Women Life Freedom Movement, has created a traumatic experience embedded in the collective memory of Iranian society, haunting its present. The works of artists respond to their own experiences with the context of cultural trauma that permeates the entire society. This position relates to the ontological questions with which artists engage with, when addressing their contemporary <coughs> conditions, namely critical retellings of a past that continues to haunt the present like a ghost. Ontology provides a useful framework for our inquiry, particularly when addressing the topics of historical memory and trauma. According to Derrida, the aim of ontology is to allow these ghostly presences, figures, ideas, or events from the past that have been marginalized or silenced to speak again. Here, ghosts signify repressed histories, ideologies, or unresolved traumas that continue to shape the present. Just as those famous uh, uh, ontological uh, uh, scholars like Mark Fisher and Simon Reynolds uh, discuss ontological musicians who explore ideas linked to temporal incoherence, cultural memory, and the resistance of the past, the works of these artists that I'm going to talk about similarly engage with these themes. They evoke the enigma of place and placelessness as well as memorialization and longing. For some reason, it doesn't move. <laughs> Examples of these works vary, but before examining the main case studies, I would like to address a few other examples. Among these is Azadeh Akhlaqi's uh, stage uh, photography project, which she was born in 1978, and the title of this series is by an eyewitness from 2009 to 12. This series critically examines the history of Iranian intellectuals in the 20th century. It explores the ever-present and often tragic destinies of these intellectuals in modern Iranian history, implicitly revealing interrelated parallels under the Islamic Republic. The artist seeks a truth by following narratives from eyewitnesses and drawing on archival information. The series provokes essential questions related to personal histories, visual memory, and the nature of contemporary documentary. And in all of these images in this series, for example, this one, the artist is present in this one here. And this scene, for example, shows uh, the execution of uh, the activist Marzia Ahmadi, who was, I mean, the scene of uh, execution, the poet and the uh, political activist. Another example is the dreamlike imagery found in the paintings of Mehdi Farhadian, born in 1980. Farhadian's canvases depict visually dramatic scenes in which human figures and animals engage in enigmatic acts. For example, this work, pr Protected Area, fuses realistic and fictional narratives of Iran's modern history, primarily referencing the Pahlavi period. Farhadian's fantastical imagination illustrates his self-appropriated interpretations of uh, this history, visualizing the hidden melancholy embedded in the natural and architectural landscapes human characters or other elements in his works. 
Najaf Shokri's Iran Dokht series, he was born in 1980. Iran meaning uh, means daughter of Iran from 2006 to 2012. Presents found photographs of young women from old ID certificates, mostly issued in the 1940s, which were invalidated and discarded in the post-revolution period by the National Civil Registrations Organization. These personal photographs taken during the Pahlavi era feature women whose appearances do not conform to the Islamic Republic's code of compulsory hijab. These now anonymous portraits signify an almost forgotten past and highlight the controversy surrounding the prescribed amnesia enforced by post-revolutionary authorities. And now, to illustrate these concepts further, I will focus on two series of artwork by Parham Tariyov and Mohammad Ghazali. Parham Tariyov, born in 1978, lives and works in Tehran, explored strategies for processing the past. His work signifies a ontological reference to the recent traumatic past, addressing cultural repression and reshaping memory within the multiple historical contexts of contemporary Iran. Through the reproduction of historical images, Taryov aims to evacuate their original signification and reveal new interpretations. In the Asymmetrical Authority series in 2018, official memory degenerates into fragments of the artist's personal memories enabling a new historical perspective. The series consists of simultaneously recognizable and bizarre images imprinted with the recent political history of Iran, giving form to his fragmentary pictures and making the familiar unfamiliar. A symmetrical authority refers to the post-revolutionary discourse on official historiography, viewed as an unresolved problematic filled with political ideology. Sadeq Rahimi, who has worked a lot on the concept of ontology and everyday life, explains that the logic of ontology undermines any established order of power or meaning, acknowledging that the essence of reality is inherently haunted. Importantly, this concept also challenges the core principles of both utopianism and Messianism, this is according to Rahimi, reflecting the nature of Tariyov's series explored in this discussion. The series depicts how photographic images can mobilize critical historiographical exploration. Through the act of reproduction, Tariyov adopts the black and white documented photographic depictions of definitive political events such as the 1979 revolution and the Iran-Iraq war, or as Nada said, Iraq-Iran war from 1980 to 88 within these collages. The images are sourced from 30 years. A book published in 2012 by the semi-governmental media organization named Oj. Edited by Reza Tahirkhani, the book presents the, a visual account of uh, the post-revolutionary period from 1979 to 2009, containing about 1,400 carefully selected photographs that cover a wide range of social, political, cultural, and economic themes. In the introduction, it is said that its aim is to feel, I'm quoting, feel the significant gap caused by the absence of a comprehensive visual record for the contemporary history of Iran, end of quote. The sources of these images are documentary photographs, including archival news images of the revolution and the war, and of course other subjects, which have primarily been published in books through governmental channels. And this is the cover of the book and a few pages of uh, this book. The book 30 Years is intended to serve ideological narratives and produce hegemonic accounts 
of history. Unsurprisingly, in line with the ideological trajectory of the state, this, narr this narration aims to be persuasive and promotional, particularly in portraying the revolution and the war, as well as associated occurrences such as the occupation of the U.S. Embassy, as it was named by the revolutionary, the Second Revolution, in Tehran by a group of revolutionary university students in November 1979. And these are a few examples of the actual works on the right from the book 30 Years from the Revolution Days and also uh, Tagliov's uh, uh, reinterpretation of the same image. And also another example of a scene from the war, Iran-Iraq war, and uh, of course, uh, Tariyov's uh, deconstruction of the same image. And uh, lastly, a scene from post-occupation of the US Embassy, and a very iconic scene of reconstruction of the destroyed documents at the US Embassy, uh, and uh, Tariyov's uh, intervention in that image. As the title A Symmetrical Authority suggests, the central theme is the conflict between asserted forms of authority and a democratic one. The series clearly acknowledges that there is no single story, no coherent narrative, and no singular viewpoint in narrating history. The images obliterate any sense of temporal continuity or narrative integration. The symmetrical authority series suggests that what has happened in the past is not unchangeable, and every historical examination can reveal a different image of the past. Tariyov states uh, that I'm quoting, I decided to take on a role of an author for this project so that I could revise history, confront it, and even intervene in it by identifying new strains in reaction to the circumstances at hand, end of quote. He deconstructs uh, the visual narrative by concealing the identities of events and uh, protagonists in these photographs. Tariyov distorts the documentary photos by folding the images, cutting certain parts, and covering significant features of bodies by juxtaposing colored papers in blue, red, yellow, and pink, or by applying digital modifications. These actions correspond to the censorship commonly practiced by the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, particularly what the ministry is doing in censoring some particular images in European American uh, art books and magazines. Through the defamiliarization of typically familiar scenes, the artist engages in an act of subvention, challenging official propaganda with his documentary photographs. Haunted by obscure recollection, Tariyov learns to use the, en uh, the entries of his political, uh, sorry, pictorial narration to reconstruct not only what might have happened, but also what has happened. By emphasizing their status as post memories, the images in the asymmetrical authority series catalyze forms of memory that make the viewer feel distinct from the kind of history whose indicative presence is traced in these images, in particular the 30 year, the book 30 Years. The work of Muhammad Ghazali, born in 1980, he also lives and works in Tehran offers a different take on ontology. For Ghazali, photography refines the boundaries between the visible and invisible. His approach often reveals the intensely subversive and enigmatic aspects of the ordinary and mundane, while questioning the ideologically constructed truths formulated by the political system. His work interrogates this, the status of an image's past and the present, challenging the, its reliability as a historical source. By confronting our conventional trust in photographic documents, Ghazali urges us to reconsider 
why and how we encounter photographs as authenticating media of history and memory. He says, I'm quoting, I believe all photographic images generally speak about the past, as when we see a photograph, we automatically relate it to the past. In my photographs, my choice of themes inevitably leads me to become involved in the historiography of my time, end of quote. Razzoli's deceptively simple photographs with, which shift between visual stereotelling and reality encourage the viewer to become an active agent in uncovering the latent message obscured within the images. The Persepolis 2560 to 2580, and I'm going to call it, I mean, just Persepolis, otherwise it would be difficult to each time to uh, read the whole title. The series, exhibited in 2021, is also positioned at the intersection of objectivity and subjectivity, history and memory. In this process, Ghazali employs abstraction and the illusion of historical concept to generate a creative approach to the past. By providing objective accounts of a false historical narrative, the photographs in this series explore, expose the impossibility of purely truthful narration. This work is grounded in how elements of history, such as architectural features, can move and circulate in the present against the background of a history haunted by uncertain events. With the, within the ontological context, as Rahimi also man, maintains, all concepts are haunted, and they have to be haunted before they can become concepts. The central idea is that the interconnection between the physical and the symbolic is where both meaning and ghosts are born. This relates to the idea that the creation of meaning is a hauntogenic event, meaning as the process that produces meaning also creates spectral traces of the original events and entities uh, that are made sense of. Persepolis, this series, consists of a collection of 45 small monochromatic images mounted together on the wall, forming a united, sorry, a unified set along with documentation intended to emphasize their authenticity. The exhibition brochure, and this is uh, just a cover and a few pages, examples of the brochure, provides meticulous historical information about the ancient inhabitants of Persia and the construction of the palace of Persepolis, including its architectural features, structural and decorative elements like gates and motifs. The photographs are presented as if they are actual documentary records of the construction of the ancient capital city of the Cayman Empire, Persepolis. The dates 2560 to 2580 refer to the solar calendar making the construction of Cyrus, sorry, the coronation of Cyrus the Great, the first Achaemenid king in 559 BC. However, they actually correspond to the years spanning from when Ghazali, the artist, first took the photos in 2001, which would be equal according to that date to 2560 uh, from the coronation of Cyrus the Great to when the images were exhibited in 2021, which would be equal to 2580 from the project's initial concept to its materialization. The photos depict the actual construction site of the Hakim Highway in Tehran, one of the many built in the metropolis over the past decades. These images, which resemble archaeological sites, deceptively create an imaginary version of what might have occurred on the original construction site of the Palace of Persepolis. 
They function as indexical representations of the real, but doubt arises when the viewer confronts scenes lacking any phys I mean, physical markers or of memory. And this is the Ghazali's picture, and these two are pictures taken from the actual uh, remains of the Persepolis site. The enigmatic portrayal of this construction aligns with the site's lack of visual appeal and the absence of identifiable features, unlike the actual site that we saw, two examples. The viewer is left questioning how the images of pipes, girders, and metal ropes relate to the historical documents provided by the artist. Ghazali here challenges the concepts of authenticity, authentication, and true documentation. This series seems uh, to merge a moment from ancient history with the present, linking two architectural stru structures across the fissures of spatial and temporal dislocation in the process of history making. Persepolis Furthermore, I mean this series, explores the process by which a historical artifact becomes a national symbol. Ghazali invites us to examine this issue specifically regarding Persepolis, the actual Persepolis, a site that became the Pahlavi state's most prominent yet controversial symbol of nationalist policy later challenged by the Islamic Republic's anti-monarchy historical narrative. His documentary art challenges the state's refusal to accept alternative narratives beyond its ideological framework. To conclude, the artists discussed here employ various approaches to challenge the inviolability of an ideologically structured history as formulated by the Iranian state or similar one. While the two artists examined in this paper do not directly engage in explicit judgments, their work suggests a subtle negotiation through their refusal to let invisibility persist or obscurity remain. Tagliot's photographic images are imbued with an uh, uncanny quality resisting conventional visual representations. This allows him to expose a crisis of representation and memory in our time, offering a means to transcend traumatic events and the ongoing sense of instability. His asymmetrical authority series, moreover, seeks to address the legacy of a past obscured by censorship and political repression. Similarly, Ghazali's Persepolis series critiques hi histories often accepted as truth by constructed and shaped by ideological fabrication. His work centers, uh, sorry, his work counters the political will to either erase or selectively restore specific histories and cultural memories. What unites these artists is the shared encounter with the inevitable ambiguity of the past, which continue, continuously eludes them, leaving them to grapple with their haunted contemporary present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we could have um, the speakers back on stage, and if we can have Vasiv on the screen, we could have the uh, Q&A question section. Yeah, we have about, um, we're running a little bit late, but we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions before you rush off for your much needed coffee. Um, there's microphones, I think, yes, going around. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand. Yes, in the front row, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers so much. I've learned so, so, so much. I have first two tiny weeny 
um, observations um, uh, for Nada, and then um, and then something for Vasid. Uh, first of all, Nada, thank you so, so much. Fabulous and so moving for me to know that these artists are in London. I just wanted to say that I know why the daffodil is on those uh, things, and I don't know if you do. On the uh, current, um, current official documents from the state, because I learned to my... Um, kind of ironic surprise, I won't exactly say horror, that one of my long-standing um, friends who's lived in this country for years, uh, academic um, and artist, tried to acquire British citizenship. And part of the exam is you've got to know Wordsworth Daffodil poem, uh, which is absolutely unbelievable. <clears throat> but the other thing that was more more interesting question, kind of, um, comment slash question is when you talked about ancient things being presented as part of modernism <coughs> not to do with the temp contemporary artists but the ones before and I didn't know if you knew the analogies with the second world war and post-war art that I'm going to make in my paper later on is that uh, I just wanted to say that the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, immediately after the war, they first had an exhibition called 40 Years of Modern Art, and then they had an exhibition called 40,000 Years of Modern Art, because that, that, um, that the style of presenting um, charred, ruinous things was completely entering, entering post-war sculpture in Europe as a whole. And the idea of, um, of, of the... the the response to the war modern looking like the ancient and the charred was a was something that had already happened uh, maybe you'd like to re reply to that first thank you thank you so much um, good to know about the yep yeah. oh, thank you um, good to know about the daffodils yes um, indeed um, but you know also um, in terms of the ancient and the modern um, as um, most archaeologists